Everybody, so just to preview what we are doing in the Sawa, and of course the guests that we're going to have, we're going to be focusing in on vaccines. And I know that there have been so many different questions and responses from the viewers uh, with regard to the vaccine. I mean, whether we're talking about the safety of it, when the rollout can be expected, the cost of it, the side effects, um, are, are they safe, are they not safe, is there anything untoward about it? All of these questions are coming through, and this is going to be a very frank discussion about the the coronavirus vaccine and South Africa's plans thereof. Indeed, and I see some questions coming through. Uh, Pule, I see you sent us a question. Also, Ms. Bu. So um, we did ask if you have any specific questions, feel free to send them to us at Morning Live SABC, or you can make use of our personal Twitter accounts at Sakina Kamwendo, at Leanne Manis, and uh, we'll share some of those questions and ask them, put them to our panel as well. Mm. All right. In fact, we're not going to waste any time. We're going to get into it because I believe that we have all of our guests that are joining us there online. So let's talk about it. During President Cyril Ramaphosa's address to the nation uh, earlier this week, he made reference to a vaccine being available for 10% of the population in the early part of 2021. However, words such as uh, and phrases such as vaccine nationalization, gluttony, equal distribution, the hallmark of our times is inequality and the need for structural equality given the impact of the pandemic seem to be dominating the public discourse. Indeed, Leanne, and beyond pharmaceutical companies, of course, universities and countries participating in testing, such as South Africa, um, other key players are COVAX, the global partnership between developed and developing countries, and of course, a BRICS a vaccine and research development center, to name but a few. So to discuss possible COVID-19 vaccines in South Africa, we join now by a panel consisting of Dr. Anban Pillay from the Health Department, Professor Helen from uh, the Health Products Regulatory Authority and Professor Jeffrey Mpathlele of the South African Medical Research Council. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. Welcome to Morning Live. Thank you. Bye. All right, so let's, let's get the ball rolling. And I suppose <coughs> the first question that needs to be posed is, when might there be any sort of COVID-19 vaccine for South Africans, even when the president said uh, it'll be just for 10% of the population? I suppose maybe we, we should start with, with the Department of Health on that one. So um, maybe I can, I can hand this one over to you to, to answer this one. Um, uh, this, of course, is um, Dr. Anban Pillay. Let's start with you. And uh, again, good morning to you. Morning, Leanne, and morning to the viewers. Um, Yes, yeah, so, so the COVID-19 vaccines are currently in a uh, uh, regulatory assessment phase uh, across the world. We have uh, um, uh, participated in the COVAX agreement, and so we will hear from COVAX as to which vaccine exactly has been allocated to South Africa. Um, at this stage, it appears from what COVAX tells us that uh, there would be probably a dossier that will be ready in early January. And uh, if that dossier is successful at the regulators, including SAPRA, uh, we can then expect uh, rollout thereafter. Uh, they, they had uh, advised us to plan for a rollout in quarter two, early quarter two, uh, which would be um, around April 2021, uh, starting somewhere there. But these are obviously all tentative dates, uh, uh, depending on uh, on the way uh, the regulatory issues are addressed, as well as the production and other matters. So, Dr. Rees, perhaps in just looking at our participation as South Africa in some of these vaccine trials, um, how many are we involved in? Where are those trials at this stage? And, of course, many people wanting to know, like uh, Pirilani, um, can the scientists please educate us on the safety of these vaccines? Because there are a lot of theories. Yes, so, so South Africa has actually been one of the very few African countries that has participated in a number of trials. We participated in five studies, five different trials so far for five different vaccines, and more are in the pipeline. Um, because just because we have one effective vaccine now licensed in the world, that it doesn't mean that the studies won't go on. And we're going to have different uh, waves of, of new vaccines with uh, new technologies coming through over um, probably the next year. So um, we, we have participated in those, and 
Those are, have been what we call either phase two or phase three studies. So, um, and the phase three studies are the studies many of you will have heard about, where we've got tens of thousands of people around the world um, who are participating in the study to see if the vaccines are safe and effective. That's the part where you really look at large numbers of people to see if the vaccine really works. Um, in terms of safety, uh, the, all of these trials are very carefully monitored for safety in, in different ways. First of all, they all have to be approved by the regulatory authority and by ethics committees in country. Um, in addition, each of these trials has an independent board that looks at the safety of the vaccines in the trials as the trial is ongoing. Um, and they will continue to look at safety um, uh, for a period of time after the trial. So uh, they'll keep following up the participants. Once we get a licensed vaccine, once we get a vaccine that, that uh, SAPRA is able to license, there will also be very careful safety monitoring put in place um, so that we're able to see once we roll the general population, no longer in a clinical trial, but for general use, we'll be able to have a look at uh, the safety in the populations in whom we first introduce it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it Professor Mpahlele, let's, let's bring you into the conversation. I think one of the, the recurring concerns from a lot of viewers is, is the safety and the mm -hmm. fact that is it not all just too soon? Um, and, and, and I bring up theories that a lot of people are speaking to. I mean, we talk about the fact that, you know, there is still um, ongoing investigations and treatment to get a precise flu vaccine, uh, something for HIV and AIDS. I mean, we, we, we still see these and, and, and we talk about the timing thereof. These are, these are years and years of tried and, uh, you know, going back to the, the drawing board and trying again. And yet, in less than a year, just a couple of months, there is something that is already happening in terms of vaccinations against COVID-19, which, to be honest with you, doctors are still trying to investigate more about this, different strains, different this, different that. It's still very confusing. So I suppose, to cut a long story short, I mean, is it too soon? And, and that I ask you, Dr. Mpahlele, a professor, I should say. No, you're welcome. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so one can say that um, it is too soon, uh, given that um, you know the vaccine has been developed uh, within a short space of time. Uh, this is the first time we could develop a vaccine within 12 months. Um, so I think it is a genuine uh, concern. Uh, however, um, I must say that um, you know uh, when vaccines are developed, um, obviously the pathogens are different. As some pathogens, uh, it takes many years uh, to develop a vaccine, and then other pathogens, it is easy, you know, to develop a vaccine. And uh, the other breakthrough that we have uh, with the COVID-19 vaccine is the current technology that is being applied. I mean, the use of, uh, you know, messenger RNA technology uh, to develop a COVID-19 vaccine uh, is something new. And uh, it has shown that actually you can, you know, bring a vaccine within a short space of time. So what I can tell you at uh, the end is that um, um, one can say it is too soon, uh, given the time frame, uh, but, um, and, and, and also given the fact that, um, you know, um, some of the studies are still ongoing. However, um, we are quite uh, confident uh, that the safety and the efficacy of the vaccines that have been reported so far um, is quite uh, satisfactory. And, um, and, and, and one can actually, you know, proceed and use this uh, vaccine, uh, even if uh, the vaccines are used, you know, under emergency use. Uh, so uh, the safety will continue to be monitored uh, even after the rollout of the vaccine. Um, and, um, and, and, um, and, and it's just uh, typical of any vaccine. Uh, any vaccine that is introduced uh, into the system, uh, there is a... Um, uh, what we call pharmacovigilance studies, uh, which will continue uh, to monitor the safety of the vaccine. Mm. And uh, y y people are, of course, concerned, um, uh, Dr. Reese, about 
the side effects from mm -hmm. this particular vaccine. But even before we get to the side effects of the vaccine itself, there's the side effects of COVID, those long lingering symptoms. And um, there have been reports uh, that these would include things like changes to your menstrual cycle, erectile dysfunction in men, um, you know, uh, pulmonary problems and, and, and many, many others. Uh, those concerns, uh, can we speak to them for a minute? Uh, first, as it stands right now, some of the lingering effects of COVID and then some of the side effects that have already been detected uh, uh, from those who have participated in the vaccine trials. So, so you, you're raising two very good points and, and, and it's important. I'll, I'll talk about this, this long COVID that, that you've just mentioned, because when we think about introducing a vaccine, we also have to think about what's called the benefit risk. Now, we know already that this, this virus is capable of killing people. If you're older, if you have comorbidities, we know that it's capable of making people very sick. But what it's also capable of doing is what you've just described. And about 10 to 15 percent of people describe symptoms of long COVID. And this is a whole variety of symptoms, but a lot of it are things like fatigue, headache, shortness of breath, and just exercise intolerance, not being able to do anything. And so studies have shown in, in these conditions that, in fact, the lungs, when you do special studies of the lungs, that the lungs continue to be really affected, which is where the shortness of breath and the fatigue comes from. And even the heart muscle can be affected. Now, most of these symptoms will recover. But for some people, they can drag on and sort of go in waves over numbers of months. But for most people, they will fully recover, but it can go on for a very long time. Now, if you think about that death, severe illness, hospital beds being occupied, long COVID, this is a very nasty virus. So when you think about why we are trying to rush through with a vaccine um, and to try and do it in an unprecedentedly rapid way, it's because we recognize that, that this virus is going to continue to sweep around in waves and waves and waves in our community, causing incredible um, harm to individuals and to the economy. And we really have to stop it. So when we talk about safety, there is really careful, I'm going to really underscore this, Safety monitoring is being done incredibly rigorously within the clinical trials. From the time we first introduce vaccines into human subjects, we look at safety. Safety is the first thing, and it continues. And as Jeff said, it continues after we introduce it into populations. So if we don't think that something is predominantly safe, we would not introduce it. But we are pushing this rapidly because of this, this, this trying to weigh up the benefits of getting a vaccine out there and stopping the transmission of this virus versus trying to push a vaccine much more rapidly than we would normally do. Has the world ever, and, and, and I genuinely ask this, because when we talk about trying to develop it very, very fast and getting into it very quickly, has the world ever been under such pressure to develop a vaccine? And, and, and that's the reality because we've seen unprecedented reactions from the world. The global economy is on its knees. Countries are on their knees. Businesses are on their knees. And of course, there is this desire to have a vaccine faster than we ever would. But does this not come with dangers? I know you've already sort of added that into your answer, but just to elaborate a little bit further, the speed at which this is, Surely there is a, so much pressure to bring about this vaccine that maybe we're not actually looking at it properly. Well, I think, I think uh, it's a good point that you're raising, and you're absolutely correct. We've never been under such pressure to develop a vaccine. The fastest vaccine that we've developed previously was the, the mumps vaccine that took four years. So that was the fastest one we've had previously, and then the one after that was five years. But what we've done is that <clears throat> normally when you develop a vaccine, you have small numbers of people where you look for safety and the amount of vaccine you should give and how it works. And then you have a larger number, several hundred, where you start to look at the immunogenicity and you look at safety. And then you have these very large studies at the end with tens of thousands of people for vaccine trials. So in, normally <clears throat> we do phase one and then we analyze and we wait and then we'll do the phase two and we analyze and we wait and then we'll do the phase three instead of that what we've done is we've concertinaed all of that together so the phase one and the phase two and the phase two and the phase three are all overlapping each other we've cut out the dead time in between so we've concertinaed the time that's the first thing the standards applied in the phase one the phase two the phase three and when we monitor once we introduce 
are exactly the same standards as we would have for any other vaccine. We haven't lowered regulatory standards. We haven't lowered the standard of a clinical trial to try and fast track things. So we have to be very confident as regulatory authorities that we're looking at safety, the quality of the product and the efficacy of the product. We have to look at all of those. If we're not happy with that, we will not register a product. And I want to say that very strongly to the South African public. The South African Health Products Regulatory Authority has a special team set up dedicated to do this so we can do it as rapidly as possible. But we're not going to cut corners on what we look at when we evaluate that product. Now, Dr. Pillay, um, you see if you uh, scour the social media pages, people are uh, questioning uh, the distribution of the vaccine, for example. Um, just to mention some of those uh, buzz phrases that we stated at the top, vaccine nationalism, gluttony, equal distribution, um, uh, the need for structural equality given the impact of the pandemic. And we know that some of the richer countries have already indicated uh, that they will be rolling out vast amounts of these vaccines but where does that leave us because people are questioning the fact that um, we form part of the vaccine trials for example but how far down the line are we in terms of receiving distribution of these vaccines and perhaps also speak to our partnerships with BRICS nations and what we could possibly expect from them Dr. Pele. Thank you thanks for that question I think it's very important. Um, the, the uh, developing uh, uh, countries have largely uh, you know, been at the, at the back end of receiving vaccines, largely because the manufacturers of these vaccines uh, require funding and they're obviously looking at countries that will be able to pay higher prices for vaccines. So you would have noticed that uh, the US, uh, uh, um, the UK, Canada, and other uh, more developed countries and wealthier nations have been funding uh, the uh, uh, manufacturers of these vaccines very early on and uh, in the process have pre-booked uh, vaccines out of these facilities even before a vaccine was even developed. We in the developing world as such uh, um, obviously didn't have that kind of financing to be able to fund uh, uh, huge vaccine trials to the extent that they have been uh, financing. Nevertheless, what has happened is that uh, through the World Health Organization and Gavi, the COVAX facility has been established, and that is intended to achieve the equity across the world and say, well, to the vaccine manufacturers, you can't simply take your vaccine production and distribute it to the wealthiest nations and leave the developing and least developed countries with no vaccines at all, because if one of us is not safe, all of us are not safe. And so it's really important that everybody has equal access. And so the COVAX facility brings together the requirements of all the developing and least developed countries, and also has brought on board now the developed nations as well, and said, well, we, we want to collectively distribute these vaccines as soon as they become available. So the fact that you can pay a higher price or you're wealthier doesn't mean you should get more vaccine. And, so th and, and through this process now, you will find that the COVAX will access these vaccines and distribute them to countries. South Africa is clearly part of the first batch of countries that will have access to vaccines as soon as they become available. Having said that, I want to just talk about what's happening currently in the UK as well as in the US, where they're accessing largely the vaccine which has been produced by Pfizer-BioNTech. Now, that vaccine has to be stored at minus 70 degrees and is not a vaccine that uh, many developing countries would practically be able to implement. Across South Africa, we have a very limited number of minus 70 degree refrigeration facilities where we'd be able to roll out a vaccine on a mass scale that the US as well as the UK is doing. So clearly we would be looking more for a vaccine that we can roll out that can be stored at temperatures where it can be kept in the fridge, etc. And I think the number of those vaccines are coming through and as I indicated, I think in, in uh, early January, those will go through for regulatory approval and hopefully by the first uh, by quarter, uh, the first months of quarter two, we can have those vaccines in country to start our program where the 10% uh, the, um, the of the population will be able to access those vaccines. Uh, perhaps, perhaps you want to elaborate because we did see the news coming out this week that pharmaceutical company Johnson & Johnson would be the first to apply for COVID-19 vaccine registration in South Africa. Um, uh, 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 
Um, maybe, maybe Professor Mpahlele, you would like to talk to it from the, the South African, well, not really, perhaps it's the Department of Health that need to, to respond to this. I mean, we know that there are at least four coronavirus vaccine candidates being evaluated in South Africa. Which is the most favorable at the moment? Where, where, where is it leaning more towards? Well, we, we haven't seen all the trial results. We just have a sight of what's happened with the, with the Pfizer vaccine. We know about the Moderna vaccine, and now we also know about the AstraZeneca vaccine. But many of the other vaccine trials are still to be published. But some mm. of that data may be submitted directly to the regulator before it comes out in the public domain. But ideally, from a, from a theoretical perspective, you would want a vaccine that is a single dose. Many of the other vaccines are a second, are, are a two dose vaccine, meaning uh, uh, the person would have to get a second dose in about four weeks or so after the first dose, and that is quite uh, difficult to do to find the same person a second time. Additionally, I should say that the the cost of a vaccine program is probably equivalent to the cost of the vaccine, if not more, particularly with, this, with the two dose vaccine. So if I was to theoretically uh, 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 state my preference, certainly a single-dose vaccine that's kept under I know, temperature such as a, a, a refrigerator would be preferable. Mm -hmm. However, that depends on what the data tells us about the performance as well as the safety. And, and also on average, apologies, Sakina, I'm just going to just follow up quickly. I mean, we talk about a one dose, but are we talking about an annual one dose? Would that be something that we would have to get all the time? How long? would last in the system for um, you know those are a, a kind of questions I'm seeing coming through from viewers well well at this stage it's it's a one dose obviously I think as the, uh, the the trials continue and we get more data we'll understand a little bit better about whether an additional dose is required or whether a single dose is sufficient for the period of immunity I think those are questions that, that remain unanswered, and I think through the scientific research, we'll probably be able to answer those questions. Okay. And then, uh, Professor Mpatlele, how much of a concern is it that we are now seeing, for example, in the UK, a variant of the virus? Um, and, you know, in South Africa, have we already experienced uh, similar occurrences? And is it possible that these new strains, the new variants, might actually be resistant to the vaccine? Um, thanks um, for that question. Uh, very interesting. But um, I can say that um, at this stage, uh, there shouldn't be any concern uh, whether this variant will be um, um, will resist uh, the vaccines. Uh, even in the UK, where the variant uh, is circulating, uh, it's been um, shown that um, actually um, it's not a threat uh, in terms of vaccine development or performance of the vaccine. Um, so there shouldn't be any cause for concern uh, with uh, that uh, regard. Mm. I think what we need to do is, is, is quickly take a, a very short break. We uh, are going to continue this conversation. And I think I'm going to, uh, just a little bit of a preview. There's an interesting uh, uh, a tweet that has come through and an interesting question from a viewer. And this one, I, I think we need to, because there are, of course, a lot of people that are worried about this. So when we talk about comments that are coming from the Chief Justice as well, we all know about this. It was widely publicized. And this is the one coming in from Bram Moro saying, um, the Chief Justice, Mohueng Mohueng, makes it worrying to consider vaccinations against COVID-19. I wonder what comments like this are actually doing uh, for the Department of Health, for scientists, you know, things like this, we'll, we'll get those into consideration. I know we've all got views about it, but I'd like to hear from the scientists, from the professionals, how something and comments from various sources and various people are uh, putting a bit of a dampener on a vaccine rollout. So that'll be an interesting topic, one of the topics we talk about. Okay, Dr. Anban Belay, uh, Professor uh, Rees, and of course, uh, Professor Mpatlele on our panel this morning, talking about vaccines in the main. So uh, let us know what your questions are. We'll read some of those that have already come through and we'll do all of that after the break. <laughs>